you all here this morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Parker, uh, one of your pastors here along with Pastor John. It's so great to see everybody today. Uh, we have some announcements I just want to uh, bring to your attention. First of all, um, our beautiful flowers today at the altar are presented by the Oyer family in memory of their grandmother, Lillian Oyer. And um, also, we're still um, collecting and uh, giving donations for hurricane relief for hurricane ian the information is on our church website and on our conference website uh, you can go there uh, to make donations for hurricane relief and coming up next weekend is the men's retreat so this is last call for you guys if you want to go on a men's retreat 99 dollars for the whole weekend uh, food and lodging and everything so it's a great great weekend uh, it's, i think it's going to be in the 60 lower 60s so it'll be nice and cool at night up in dunellen with the campfire uh, ladies in Faith Together, the, our women's ministry, their meeting is going to be on June 14th. That's on a Monday night. Uh, they meet, sorry, November 14th. <laughs> in November, uh, th they meet uh, every month, so all the ladies are invited to that. Uh, Jan Miller's phone number's up there. That's, there's also information in the bulletin as well. And uh, just, just a reminder that next week you get an extra hour sleep on Saturday night. So don't forget, we got some clapping, huh? Some applause. <laughs> So don't forget, turn your clocks back an hour Saturday night when you go to bed. Uh, so you get extra hour of sleep. We're still having our service. It'll be 9 o'clock local time, so make sure you get your clock set right. Uh, also, today is the fifth Sunday. Whenever there's five Sundays in a month, we remember our Florida United Methodist Children's Home. So if you'd like to make any uh, donations to the Children's Home, just mark that on the envelope, uh, or you can mark that on, on the check as well. And we'll be giving, getting some more information about uh, the Christmas uh, gifts that the Children's Home has uh, been promoting, uh, gift cards to send up uh, throughout the month of November because they need to arrive in the first month of December so they can take the children shopping and more information will be coming about that. Uh, also today uh, we recognize as All Saints Sunday and so on this day we recognize those that have gone before us in glory uh, so we want to have a few moments of silence as we read uh, the names of those as we remember those who have gone on before us. So let us pray. 
Thank you, God, for the tremendous sacrifices made by those who have gone before us. Lord, bless the memories we have of all your saints. And may we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love. Casey Adams. Jennifer Adrini. Ron Bade. Margaret Beekmeyer. Sally Bergener. Louisa Blank. Roberta Chenoweth. Elizabeth Christensen. Ann Coker. Michelle Cooprider. Charles D'Augustine. Robert Daughtry. Lois Oya Dooley. Jean Dyer. John T. Frank. Herbert Gager. Diane Granger. Patricia Hayden. Ruth Heath. Craig Hurwitz. Betty Koryakin. Dorothy Link. Jim Lowe. Rush Mayfield. Karen Moy. Pat Ramsayer. Ron Richardson. Shelley Schneider. Joan Shropshire. Harold Tatler. Professor Dr. Ng S. P. Verma. Rita Verma. Dennis Weibel. Yvonne Wilson. Sandy Yeal. Gracious and loving God, as we gather here for worship today and we remember the saints that have gone on before us, fill us with your presence, comfort us. Fill us with your compassion, your love, and understanding. Help us, Lord, to continue to grow in our relationship with you, to be a shining light, to be a witness to those who are watching. Lord, our hearts go out to those who have lost loved ones. And Lord, we think about those that around the world who are struggling, those who can't find fresh water to drink or food to eat, for the wars that are happening around the world, for countries that are in turmoil. Lord, all these we, we offer up to you. But we give you thanks, Lord, that we are here. We thank you for the breath of life that we have. Let us never take that for granted. And also, let us not, never take for granted the opportunity we have to gather as your children, as your people, to worship you, to sing praises to you, to hear your holy word proclaimed, and to lift up the name of Jesus. We thank you, and we praise you this day. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen. So let's take a few moments right now. Let's stand up and greet each other this morning in the passing of the peace.
Are you all ready to lift up your voices and praising the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Let us sing together our first hymn, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Thank you. 
Thank you, Miss Brenda. And kids go. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. If you're able to, please stand now as we reaffirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 And now let us bow our heads and our hearts as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue to worship this morning, one of the ways that we worship God and show our gratitude and our thankfulness and gratefulness is giving of our tithes and offerings, giving back a portion of what we've been so greatly blessed with. So I invite the ushers to come forward at this time as we have an opportunity to give back our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. stand. your blessings on each gift and each giver alike allow these gifts to be multiplied to go out into this world to spread your kingdom that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and we pray it all in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit and all of god's people said amen amen, amen. you may be seated
Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. Fantastic. You know, um, I've been thinking a lot this past week, past couple of weeks actually, about gratitude, about all the very many things that I'm grateful for. And, and this is an example right here. Um, wonderful, wonderful. You know, as some of you may already know, uh, my wife Joyce is out of town visiting with family this week. So I've been flying solo uh, the past couple of days, and I'm not grateful for that, but <laughs> <laughs> I am grateful for the fact that God got the two of us together. You know, that, that really is a wonderful thing. It's a great story. One of these days I'll share it with you all, but the two of us have been thinking about, you know, with leading up to, to Thanksgiving, and I wrote the article for The Beacon the other day, and I was thinking about Thanksgiving season and, you know, all the different things that are going on and so on. We were talking about all the things that we're grateful for. I mean, we're grateful for, for having health, you know, for having life and breath and all that. Grateful for three wonderful adult children who have grown up, each in their own right, to be really good-hearted people. And we're really grateful to have been placed here in our church family. I mean, it's a wonderful group of people. Uh, as I get to know folks more and understand more about all the different gifts that people have, and the way that we're all aligning and working towards common goals, it's just, it's really, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We're working hard to make a positive difference in people's lives here and throughout the entire community. And we want to expand that. And there's so many people who have shared that as a goal with me that, you know, they'd just like to see the church continue to flourish and grow and have people a hundred years from now look back and say, wow, look at what they all did thankful for all of that. I'm thankful for the leadership team of our church and the way that we've been working together to start to set direction again and to, to manage all the different things that are required to keep our church operating smoothly. It's a big, big job. It's way more than any one or two people can handle. Uh, it's something that uh, really it takes all of our leadership in conjunction. You know, discernment works best in Christian community. It's something that I often like to say and and I am thankful, too, for our nominations team. We've uh, just concluded nominations. For those of you who are not familiar, nominations is Methodist speak for uh, when we get together, people who know the congregation fairly well, know the people of the congregation fairly well, and we look at all the different roles that we have in terms of our leadership, all the different functions. There's finance and trustees and SPRC, which is like personnel committee, we look at all these different things and we say who would be best suited for the health and the life of the church to, to serve in these different roles. And so we're, we're just wrapping that, that work up um, now. You might recall me saying, I've said it on a number of occasions, the United Methodist Church is lay leader led. That's been all throughout our history since very early times. The United Methodist Church is intended to be lay leader led. And Parker and I, Pastor Parker and I, we definitely have a voice. You may notice at times my voice is pretty loud. <laughs> my opinion I share, you know, pretty openly, and, and Parker is, you know, does as well. I mean, we have strong beliefs about things. But ultimately, it's the leadership of the church that votes on things, and some things are even bigger than that. It's the entire church in a church conference that votes on things. So that's where, if you want to call it, the power resides in the United Methodist Church. It's vested in the leadership, working on behalf of the congregation, and for really big decisions, it's the entire congregation that gets involved in that. So like I said, discernment works best in Christian community. There's many other things that I'm grateful for when I, you know, I really start thinking about it. I mean, the choir I mentioned earlier, and Cindy, and Tom and all his years of service, all the different folks that volunteer in all the different capacities. Our ushers, when we were doing offering a little while ago, the folks who step up and serve there, Ms. Brenda and what she does, the people that are in the sound booth, um, Jane and Dan, and then also, you know, Ralph and Sally are on vacation right now. They, they serve there as well. There's so many different folks that do different things. Miss Bonnie's always at the door greeting people when we get here, and Ms. Lauren's back there in the corner, and she greets at the door. And I know there's others who do that as well. And I always see Ed Cooprider faithfully 
cleaning the, the leaves off and the gutters and all the different things that people do behind the scenes. And the trustees, they take care of the property. I mean, there's all these different hands that make this ship sail and, and do the things that we do. But you know, when you think of it, none of this would be possible. None of it would be possible if it wasn't for the folks who planted this church way back in 1905. Those faithful folks that got together and planted it and all the people in all the different seasons since then who came before us who worked so hard to make this a place to gather together and to worship God. And when I sit and think about it, I'm sometimes overwhelmed, but I'm very grateful for all that work. You know, as a church, we're entering into the season of the year now. It's a very important season. It's the season where we give the finance team the information they need in order to build our operating budget for next year, for 2023. That's a really big job. If you've been involved in doing budgeting, it's, it's a lot of work to do. You have to go through all the different areas of the church, all the different line items, right on down to paper towels and supplies, everything. We have to project what costs will be so that we can make sure that we keep the ship afloat and heading in the right direction throughout all of next year. And we're blessed to have people who have the skills of doing that kind of work. So over the course of the next two weeks, we'll be taking a look at some of what scripture has to say about giving. And some of what I have to say is directed mainly at those who are already members of our church, as well as those who are thinking of joining. It's, it's great to know how things operate. I know there's some folks who are have, have a heart towards joining the church, and that's a wonderful thing. We'll make opportunities uh, for that going forward. But I hope and trust that everybody, no matter who it is, who might be hearing us talk about this, uh, you'll find something of value in the next few weeks ahead because it's all based on what Jesus talked about and everything that Jesus said is of value. So for anybody who might be new to the United Methodist Church, I think it's really important that we take a few moments and talk about some of the key things about how finances are handled by our leadership team. And first off, the salary for United Methodist pastors, for Pastor Parker and for myself, we don't get a vote on that. That's set by the church. That's already in place for, for next year. So whenever we talk about giving, all of the focus is around the mission of the church. And that's building people up spiritually that are already part of the church and reaching out in the community and connecting folks to God through Jesus. That's, that's our twofold mission. That's what we're all about. So everything is all geared towards that. And second is the fact that our church has many checks and balances all throughout all of our administrative functions. And that's to make sure that finances are always handled in a way that honors God and respects people's privacy. So I always like to make it clear to folks, I have no idea who does what in terms of giving. I don't ever want to know. I've asked from the day one when I first stepped up on the platform and the bishop laid hands on me at my very first church and ever since then I've always said, I don't want to know. I want to, I want to see people as people and not think about what people do behind the scenes. I don't want to know. So only the finance team knows who gives what, nobody else. And there's always two people, at least two people, doing the counting at all times. So all of our, our finances are handled in a way that honors God, respects people's privacy. And there never can be two people from the same family on the finance team. That's another check and balance uh, that we have. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, when we talk about giving, what we're talking about is the fact that we're encouraged by God to give as we're able. God doesn't expect from us things that we can't do. God expects us to do what God puts on our heart. And that's the thing that's between an individual and God and a couple and God, a family and God. It's not anything that's anybody else's business. And everybody's in a different season of life. I'm, I'm always thinking about the fact whenever I get up here to preach that I'm talking to a large group of people and People are in different seasons. Sometimes there's people who are walking through the door who don't know where their next meal is coming from. They don't know how they're going to pay their bills next week. And so to talk about finances and giving is, seems like it's an overwhelming subject. God understands that. God only asks us to do what God wants us to do, what God puts on our heart based on what we're able to do. 
God gives to us first and then asks us to give back in return. And that's really the focus of our reading this week. It's from the gospel according to Matthew. You might recall that Matthew is one of the 12 apostles, one of the, one of the folks that Jesus had handpicked to follow in his footsteps and to carry his message and to be the first leaders of the early church. And before Matthew met Jesus, he was a tax collector. You might recall that was like one of the most despised of occupations in the ancient day because they looked at the tax collectors as being sellouts to the Romans who occupied them. I think sometimes about our IRS agents and um, if you take that and multiply by a thousand, that probably puts you about the same place. But he was sitting, Matthew was sitting in his tax booth one day and he's, you know, he's collecting taxes from the people. There's a burden that were placed on the folks. And Jesus walks up to him and he looks at him for a few moments and he says, follow me. It's just the two words he says is follow me. And Matthew leaves everything behind. He leaves the booth, he leaves the money, he leaves his books, he leaves his job. And he follows Jesus. Can you imagine having that kind of charisma that Jesus had? I mean, just the, the astounding impact that he had on, on folks. An instantaneous response of Matthew, or at least that's how it reads in the God. Maybe he'd seen him, maybe he'd heard him, we don't really know. But Matthew left everything to follow him. And he wrote this great gospel for us that we're reading 2,000 years later. So we're, we're picking up in our reading today in the middle of something that's called Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which a lot of folks are familiar with. It contains many of Jesus' best-known teachings. And he's giving instructions on, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he's giving instructions on how we're to live our lives before God and before others as well. So I'm starting out in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to hop to 16 through 21. Jesus is talking here. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your Father, who sees what's done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what's done in secret, will reward you. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, in one of the other translations of, of this text, when Jesus starts this particular section out, he starts out with the word beware. Here he says in the NIV, he says, be careful. But in another translation, he says, beware. And I like that, uh, that, 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 that word, beware. And it reminds me when my kids were small and they were watching Winnie the Pooh and there was this song about heffalumps and woozles. Some of you might know that. And, and he's singing, beware, beware, beware. It just really kind of catches your attention, beware. He says, beware that you do not practice your piety before others in order to be seen by them. 
And what he's talking about, he's cautioning folks. If you think about the context, you think about what was going on then, there were a lot of people that were, um, Jesus called them hypocrites, really, that they were doing things in order to be seen by others. And so he's, he's calling out the motivation of why people do the things that they do. You know, piety is not a word that we use that much anymore. It has to do with how we relate to God and relate to others based on our faith and our beliefs. And sometimes we're more familiar with hearing it in the, in the phrase of being overly pious, like, like someone who's holier than thou. And, and if you've seen people like that, there's a kind of an air about folks like that that kind of rubs you the wrong way. And that's what Jesus was really was getting at. He says that when we give, we shouldn't make a big deal out of it. Shouldn't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. You think about that, there's a head in between, but you know, there's this sort of a silence between the two, the two sides there that he's talking about. And essentially what he gets at is that if our motivation is wrong, there'll be no reward from God. And he repeats that as the theme throughout what he's talking about here. Now what jumped out to me, what I find really interesting is the way Jesus phrases this. He says, when we give. He doesn't say if. It's assumed that our faith is going to motivate us to help out, to join together in a collective. And if you think about the collective they had at the time was the folks in the temple. And Jesus really honored the people who were doing things from their heart rightly. And he called out those who were making a show of themselves. Now, giving is an act of worship. It's part of the relationship between us and God and others. It's really, when you think about it, it's a community kind of thing. And Jesus always points out that God's our ultimate source. He gives us everything we have, including our life and our breath and our ability to earn a living. And God blesses us in so many ways. And what, what God asks is that we give back to the work of growing the kingdom, of helping connect people to God through Jesus and then helping them to grow spiritually in that relationship. And as we give, here's where God says to test him in this. The only place you find in Scripture, in the Old Testament and in the New, where, where it basically says to test God in this, that as we give, God gives back to us. It's often said you cannot outgive God. Now, for the Jews, they were commanded by their Old Testament law to tithe, to give a tenth of what they receive, crops or income or whatever that may be. That was, that was the standard. And for Christians, that's been the standard for generations ever since Jesus till today. But you find also that Paul says things like in proportion to how God has blessed us. So proportionate giving is definitely uh, foundational in scripture, but we should never be legalistic in any sense. Legalism is, is a bad thing. And if you've been around that kind of legalistic kind of environment, um, it, it, leaves a, it leaves a negative impression on folks. Christian giving is meant to be something between the individual, a couple, a family, and God. That's it. That's where, that's where it's at. I remember being in my first church, and I had put out an offer if people wanted to join the church, and a lady came up to me, and she says, what, what do we have to do? And I said, well, you know, basically, we'll get together. We'll talk a little bit about um, our membership uh, vows, you know, we, we pledge our time, our talents, our treasure, and then we'll, we'll have a short um, um, ceremony up in front and welcome you into the church. You know, I already knew she was a person of faith, that she believed in Jesus and so on. So she goes, I don't have to bring my tax return? I said, what? She goes, well, when I was in church earlier, we had to bring our tax return to prove that we were, I had never heard of such a thing before. I mean, I was shocked. And so I said to her, of course not. No, this between you and God, what you do. So she joined our church. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Great, great couple. But Jesus goes on in the scripture. He talks about praying. And praying, of course, is an act of worship too. And like giving, it's something that Jesus expects all of us to do in proportion to how we're gifted. Some people are just, you know, they're not natural prayers. My favorite prayer is, Lord, help and I, that comes out of my mouth sometimes, you know, I'm struggling with one thing or another, you know, a little drama with a kid, you know. I remember my parents saying to me, you're always a parent, you know, and so there's always things that 
to them at that time, Brenda in her great message, she was talking about the things that seemed so important when she was younger. And I look at my children and I think sometimes about times in my life when certain things seem so insurmountable. And they'll call and they'll say, oh, I've got this or that going on. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, two years from now, you won't even remember this, right? But when we pray, um, it's, it's an act of worship. Now, some of the people of Jesus' day, they liked to pray really loudly on the street corners. And I mean, this was a practice that they had developed and they made a big show of themselves. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. And I may have shared, I think at one point, the word actually, if you go into the original language, it means the one who wears the mask. It comes from Greek, Greek drama. So he's basically saying that they're wearing a mask and concealing their real self, whether they realize that or not. So instead, Jesus says we're to pray to God who's in secret and God will reward us. God sees our hearts and God rewards us. Doesn't mean that we can't pray publicly like Pastor Parker and like I do here, like we all do sometimes if we're in a group or whatnot. It's all about the motivation, whether it's from the heart or if it's trying to be seen and, and earn the recognition of others somehow. And that's what Jesus is warning against. And so finally, he talks about fasting about going for a period of time without eating, which I'm thinking it'd be the wrong motivation for me to fast to get rid of some of my corporation here, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> it might not be a bad idea for me to do. But fasting is also an act of worship, and if you've ever tried that before, our stomach has a way of reminding us pretty insistently that it wants food, right? And the, the idea behind fasting is to go without something that we feel like we need that's really what it is it doesn't have to be food something that we feel like we need and when we are reminded of the the need that we turn our attention to god so fasting's a way of turning our attention towards towards the lord the lord it's an ancient spiritual practice but we can fast from all sorts of other things like tv news i've been fasting from tv news for a while because it's not a pleasant scene right now with you know november 8th coming up and that's all I'm going to say about that, but there's there's a lot of chatter going on, and that's 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 um, it can be unsettling, and it can disrupt our peace, and peace is really important part of our spiritual walk, being able to retain peace. Or we could fast from Facebook. My gosh, I know some people. If you took their Facebook, they'd for a day, they probably would have an issue with that. That could be a you could say you're going on a Facebook fast or a Twitter fast or or whatever it may be, whatever it is that's a priority in life, whatever it seems that we keep going back to in life. So fasting, in all its different facets, whether it's food or other things, it's a means of focusing on God and putting Jesus first at the very top of our priority list. Sometimes when I preach, I talk about how we think about priorities. For me, it's kind of like an ascending ladder some of the rungs of the ladder, there's multiple things, like my three children are on one of the rungs. They're pretty high up at the top. But I, I try to live, and I don't always make it, I try to live as if my relationship to God is all the way at the very top. Sometimes I'm reminded that that might not be the case, and that, that kind of catches me, and I, I have to stop, and I have to think about how am I going to fix that? What am I going to do about it? That's what Jesus means when he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's talking about our priorities, the things that each of us hold to be most important in life. And we can tell a lot about our priorities by looking at our calendar, how we spend our time, and looking at our bank register, how we spend our money, what we do with things, and how we choose to use money. Now, throughout the Gospels, Jesus is always encouraging people to focus on our relationship to God and to remember to be grateful for all that God's done for us. It's an attitude of gratitude that he's trying to, to foster in all the folks that are listening to him. You see that all throughout the Gospels, this attitude of gratitude is being like foundational to our relationship with God, thanking God for all the things that God does. Now, some time ago, <clears throat> I saw a video from the country of Chile that had gone viral. And I don't remember exactly where it was that I saw it. It might have been on Twitter, it might have been on Facebook. I, I float around. I'm not a big social media person, 
but I do check things out, especially when people will send me a link. And you might have seen this. The video starts out showing a large dog in an alleyway next to a, it's an alleyway next to a kind of a rundown building. And on the side of the building, there was this big tattered awning that was draped and hanging down. And somehow the dog had gotten his head and half his body through the awning and it got all wrapped up in the thing. So he was trapped and he was thin. And he looked like he was angry and hungry. He's snapping at the awning and trying to get himself free, but he's, he's caught. He can't do anything about it. So the very next scene you see in the video is this Chilean uh, police officer who climbs over the fence, over the gate, gets into the alleyway, steps into danger's way right up near this dog, and he takes a large pocket knife out of his pocket. Now the dog doesn't know whether or not the guy is there to help him or not, and the dog's all freaked out. And so the officer sort of tries to keep distance from the teeth that are snapping at the awning and a little bit at him, and he takes the pocket knife and he very carefully cuts the awning and slowly but, but uh, gradually is able to cut the dog free. As soon as the dog is freed, the dog stands up on his hind paws and he puts his paws around the officer and gives him a big hug. And you just see the police officer has this huge smile on his face. It's a great, great image. And I was looking at that and I was thinking to myself that um, it's kind of a picture of starting off in a relationship with Jesus. Gratitude for having been set free from all sorts of things. You know, the dog, of course, was wrapped in the awning, but, but different people are set free from all sorts of different things. And it's a little different for each of us. Some of us have grown up in the church and maybe we don't have a memory of ever being in a place where we really felt like we were set free from something. But for others, others um, do. And for me, it's having been set free over 20 years ago from a history of substance abuse. I may have mentioned that, um, but that's the, that's the fact. That's the, that was my priority at one day was, at one point in my life, was not anything else other than chasing after chemistry. We'll just call it that. Set free from destructive self-thinking, self-thinking, the self-destructive thinking, the patterns, I mean, uh, unbelievable patterns of behavior that easily could have put me into an early grave. And that's exactly what happened to several of my friends that I used to run with. Um, I think about in, in Waterbury, Connecticut, every time I go by on Route 84, exit 26, there's a hillside where my friend Dan is laid to rest and uh, others, you know. But God had other plans for my life. And I am super grateful for the people who patiently worked with me and talked to me and established a relationship with me and got me to open my eyes and to see that, help me to see that. God always wants what's best for us, for all of us. And God's always working. God's always trying to lead us to see for ourselves how he's intended for all of us to be channels of blessing to bless other people. God works through us. We're Jesus' hands and feet. And God intends for us to be like that Chilean police officer, but to work with folks and to help free them from whatever traps them in life and connect them to God through Jesus. And the heart of the gospel, I've said this before, the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is mission, it's reaching out. And God blesses us as we engage in that work in whatever way we engage in it, whether it's directly with going out and connecting with people, whether it's supporting efforts to do that, whether it's keeping the church functioning well and strong so that when people come here, we can connect them, we can help them to grow. God blesses us as we engage in the work of missions. God intends all of us, every single one of us, to be channels of blessings to others. So our leadership team is talking about, we're planning for, we're thinking about the future. Next steps that we can take, what we can do to continue to build up and to grow. And we're planning on running something starting in January called the Alpha Course. Some of you may recall me talking about this. The Alpha Course is wonderful. It's a 10 week course. We're gonna run it on Thursday evening starting around mid-January. This will be the fifth time that I've run this. I've run it four times in two other churches, 
three in one and uh, one in the other. And every single person that's been in it has loved it. I had a guy who was 93 years old. We used to call him St. Glenn. And um, Glenn was in church his entire life. And he said to me afterwards, he goes, these are all different things that I learned at different points in time, but this has stitched it all together into a framework. I had another guy, um, an atheist, I won't mention his name, not you know, anybody that you would know, but I just, you know, I, I keep people's beliefs private and things, confidentiality is important to me. But he went from being an atheist to ag agnostic, which was, which was a big step. It's a big step to go from being sure there's no God to questioning maybe there is. So it's designed for everybody across the entire spectrum. And one of the great things about it, it serves, Alpha serves multiple purposes. We'll be talking about that a lot more as, as we get closer to actually announcing the planning and the dates and so on. But, but for now, just consider setting aside Thursday evenings. Uh, we'll be offering it right here in the, in the fellowship hall. It'll be something I think that you really enjoy. And around the same time, right after the first of the year, we'll be putting together a mission and vision team to work on updating our mission statement and on developing and refining our vision for our future together as a church. Th those are really big and important things, to have a clear and concise mission statement that's current. Ours is good, but it needs to be updated. And to think about where God's calling us all. And that takes prayer and discernment, so I'd, I'd ask us all to be thinking about praying for that but you know the ultimate gift that we can give the one that has the greatest eternal significance in the eyes of God and also in the eyes of those who receive it is to help people to come to faith in Jesus and then help them begin and continue to grow in their faith that's the thing that's the most important of all that's the thing that when I I'm talking to people who are at the very last season in their life. That's the thing that people are most grateful for, the folks who helped guide them into a relationship with God and the certainty that they have of where they'll be waking up once they cross over that line. And it's all our calling as a church. It's our obligation to fill, fulfill to, to all those who have gone before us to continue in this work to the generation that we have around us now and to generations to come, to, to, to continue to pass the faith on to others. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, God, for our church, for this place, this wonderful place that we, we share together, that we can gather, that we can lift up the name of Jesus, that we can invite others into a warm and wonderful relationship with you through all that Jesus has done for us and it is a finished work God all we ever do is we say yes to that that little knock on our hearts from you God bless us as we continue to plan for the future as we work on growing your church because it is your church it's on loan to us help us to do the things that you'd have us to do to continue to be a shining beacon that burns bright here for decades, centuries to come. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things, and all God's people say, amen. I invite you all to please stand if you are able for our closing hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Let's all pray for a moment. God, we pray that the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, will guard all of our hearts and minds this day and every day till we meet again. Lord, lead us from here, guide us out, help us to think through our priorities. Father God, help us to place you first in all that we do, knowing full well that you will bless our efforts. Help us, God, to continue to grow your kingdom here in Boynton Beach. And we promise that we will give you all the glory for all the work that you will do through all of us. It's in Jesus' name we all pray and all God's people say, amen. Have a wonderful week.